So your qualifications to serve, you need to be a U.S. citizen. You need to be a registered elector of the town of Erie. You need to be a resident of the town of Erie for the 12 months preceding the election. And if you're applying as a council member in a district, you have to have resided in that district for 12 months prior to um, applying. And then you need to be currently eligible to vote in the state of Colorado general elections. So all pretty simple. Um, you're ineligible to serve if any of these apply to you. So if you're con convicted of any of the following offenses, which I'm not going to read those, but if you are, um, if you are convicted after you get elected, your seat will become vacant um, upon your conviction. And you cannot apply if you are an employee of the town of Erie or a board or commission member. So if your term is up, though, you can apply, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Or if you vacate. You would vacate your board. Of, you would vacate your, if you become elected, then you would vacate. So, yes. So, technically, we're employees of the town. So, we can send <laughs> on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Um, the form of government we have is council manager with home rule. This is what we were before. It's what we are now. Um, just a little bit different, but um, all the powers are vested in the elected town council, which is to enact local legislation, adopt budgets, determine policies, and appoint the town manager. Um, I'm sure there are other things that fall under that, but that's what I put on here. So, um, and the authority is the authority that you are granted is, is possible under the Constitution in, this, in the state of Colorado. So um, it's all the authority that's possible um, there. So town council and mayor. Town council includes a mayor and six council members. The mayor is elected at large by the registered electors of the town. So the entire town um, elects the mayor. The six council members are rep are elected from three districts, two from each district. So if you had seven people running, it would be for this one, for this election, since this is our first under home rule, um, it would be the top vote getter would be the first council member for four years. The second highest would be council member for two years. And then it would be four years from then on out. Um, and like I said, mayor and council members are elected to serve for four years. And um, no elected mayor or council member shall serve more than two consecutive terms in one office. Nomination requirements, candidates for mayor are required to obtain 50 ballot signatures. And this came from the Holton Rule um, Charter. Um, ballot signatures on the candidate nomination petitions and council members are required to obtain 25 signatures from within their district. So we have a little bit different thing where we have to separate by district and all of that and then uh, figure out, make sure everybody's in that district before we can count them as a voter for you. And the mayor, it's 50 from anywhere? Anywhere, yes. Um, your nomination petitions can be circulated beginning tomorrow. I have some here that I can give you tonight. You just can't circulate them till tomorrow. And I have a little uh, instruction sheet on the front of there that tells you how they work and what you need to do. Um, so that's actually the way the state or the way the state says it, it's 91 days prior to the election, which would be August 6th. And then your last date to circulate is August 26th. However, on August 26th at 5 p.m., you have to turn them in to me because I leave at 5 p.m. So they have to be turned in to me by 5 p.m. If I'm not here or it's past 5 p.m., those are not going to count. Um, and we always suggest that you obtain more signatures than you need because um, some be could become ineligible or not count or whatever. And um, we also suggest that you try to turn them in earlier if you have them done. Um, just in case there is a problem and you need to get more signatures, you want to have time to cure that petition, nomination petition before the deadline falls. So if you get them done on day number four, I would turn them in then and we'll check the, we'll check them then and we'll let you know if there's a problem. Um, yes, sir. Are 
is the town clerk able to provide notary services for the candidate affidavit nomination petition service? We are not going to, just because we feel that's a conflict of interest. We do have Lori at the front desk. She can do that. Um, and if she's not here, I'm sure there are other, there are plenty of town or notaries here in town, but you can always go to your bank and they usually do it for free there as well. So, yes, sir. Do the same eligibility requirements for candidacy apply to petition signer, residency and all that for four months? That's a good question. As long as they're, as long as they live in your district for a council member, then you should be fine. And I don't think it's the year long. I don't think so because I don't think I saw that in there. But I will double check that and get back to you on that. So this is what the nomination petitions look like. We have two. We have one for mayor and one for a council member. And you need to put your district number on there. One, two, or three. Um, I just wanted to give you a heads up because that's what the top of the nomination position looks like. This is where the signatures go and you need to make sure that you get a signature, a printed name, a street na number and name, the city, town and zip code, the county and the date. If you are missing one of those, I can't accept that signature. So, um, and hopefully the printed name is legible. <laughs> so I sort of have to verify that they live at that address. So um, just make sure that everybody fills out everything incomplete. Um, and then, so in um, the mayor's in the ma in the mayor race, people can only sign a, a the a mayoral nomination petition once. So if there's seven candidates for mayor, they can only sign one. So we have to check to make sure nobody else is signing others. And if they have the one that was signed first, earliest first first or the earliest. That one counts, the others do not. And if they're signed on the same day, they both don't count. So that's sort of how that works. And the same thing for council members. You can have, you can sign two council members uh, petitions per district. Um, and we have to keep track of who signed what when so that we don't get more than them signing more than one petition. So I hope that makes sense. I didn't explain that very well, but I hope that makes sense. And then whoever, if you have people helping you or if you do it, whoever does it, you need to fill out the affidavit of circulator and it needs to be notarized. Um, so that's your one or one of your notarization pages. The other one is your uh, affidavit accepting the nomination and this is filled out by you, excuse me. And then it's also notarized as well. And the bottom line is to print your name as you want it to appear on the ballot. That's what we will do. And in Weld County, I don't know if Boulder is requiring, but Weld County last time required um, candidates to call in and say their name so that they, I don't know why, but they ask you to do that. And I've already gotten a notice that you'll all need to do that in Weld County. So I know that's happening. So I will get that information out to you if you fill out a petition. Uh, candidate Oh, these are for signs. Um, so Gabby prepared this. This is for signs, political signs that you put. They're not allowed in the right of way or anything like that, but um, they're regulated the same way as other temporary signs. Um, it has to be four square feet in size. And then there's the municipal code, code that you can refer to. Um, and the code inspector is monitoring for sign compliance. Um, if your sign is larger than four square feet, you need to get a temporary sign permit. And I'm not quite well sure where those come from. It's not the clerk's office. So I would have to look that up as well. Uh, so your accepted your accepted uses are they have to be four feet, four square feet in signs without needing to acquire a temporary sign permit. Signs can be within the property line of a residential or commercial areas with the owner's permission. And signs can be placed in soft surfaces like grass or dirt with a stand. <clears throat> we'll these are the prohibited uses. They cannot be attached to trees, light poles, street lights, or any other signage that's out. Um, they cannot obstruct or inter interfere with the view of any traffic sign or signal. They cannot have elements that flash, rotate, or move in any way. 
and generally no more than two signs are allowed per property. And you can refer to code for those exceptions that where you could put more than two. Signs cannot be placed in the right of way. The right of way in most cases extends from the center of the roadway to the furthest point on the sidewalk. That means that if you've got a house with a yard, sidewalk, and then a tree, grassed area where trees are along the street, you can't put them in that tree grassed area. It has to be in your yard, not in the tree grassed area because it's the furthest line of the sidewalk. The freedom of speech situation where you can have as many signs as you can vote for on, on balance. So you can have three, technically, two council, one mayor, because those are each up for election. So you're telling me that? Clarifying, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I got this information from Gabby, who spoke with Mike Lloyd, and this is the information she got from Mike Lloyd. So... I can I can verify that I'll check that out and find out for sure because I didn't know that. So the code inspector is going to check frequently to, um, the signs to make sure they're compliant. Any that are non-compliant will be removed. Um, any that the town staff removes, they will be placed between our two entry doors at the front of town hall, and you can come by and pick them up at any time and reuse them, redistribute them if you want. Um, and then after the election, we're going to offer a place for you to drop them off for recycling. We don't know where that is yet, but stay tuned. We'll let you know. Yes. If the non-compliant signs are on private property, do those ones get removed or does the property owner get cited? If they're on private property and you have the property owner's Okay. Not okay. okay. Then I would assume the property owner will call and tell somebody that it's there, like the PD, and then the PD will remove it. But I'm asking specific if there were three or four signs in this yard, is the code inspector going to go onto the yard and take you a call, or will they contact them? I'm not quite sure, but I can find that out. Okay. Sure. And then we get to campaign finance. I'm really sort of versed on this. I did a class just a few weeks ago. Um, so um, a candidate is a person who's seeking nomination or election to any municipal offices. And for the Fair Campaign Practices Act purposes, um, a person becomes a candidate if she, he or she publicly announces an intended intention to seek elective office and thereafter has received a contribution or made an expenditure in support of candidacy. So a standalone candidate is the exact same thing, except they are not going to solicit for money. They're going to use their own money or, yeah, only spends his or her own money. They're not going to solicit or accept contributions to their campaign. So if they're using only their money to pay for their campaign, then they are a standalone candidate. This is a long one. So these are the uh, the committees that go along with um, the uh, with uh, nomination nomination petitions. And um, so one is a candidate committee. It's one or more persons with the purpose of accepting or making contributions expenditures under the authority of the candidate. <clears throat> and I don't know why it says that, but it says a candidate can be the only member of his or her committee. So I, that doesn't make sense to me, but um, I'll look into that. And the candidate can only have one committee under themselves. An issue committee is one or more persons whose major purpose is to support or oppose a ballot issue and has accepted or made contributions expenditures in excess of $200. And then a small scale issue committee is an issue committee that has accepted made contributions expenditures not exceeding 5,000 during an election for the purpose of supporting or opposing a ballot issue or question. Um, and for small scale issue committee, registration requirements begin when they accept or make contributions, expenditures in excess of $200. Once they exceed 5,000, a small scale issue committee automatically becomes an issue committee and must re-register as an issue committee. 
So if they spend more than 5,000, they have to re-register. I believe yes. that third point means that the candidate doesn't have to have anybody else. They can just be their own committee. Okay. Oh, can be, can be. Yes, that's true. So the required forms that you have to submit once you become a candidate is a candidate affidavit, which is included in the packet I'm giving you tonight. The committee registration form, that's not in there, but you can get that from me. Um, and re reports of individual contributions in the amount of $20 or more, or you can, if you have ones that are, you know, $2, $5, $7, and you, you can aggregate them to 20 each and just do an aggregate of $20. So, and then all expenditures, regardless of the amounts. And then if you are a standalone candidate, you just need to do the candidate affidavit and then report all your expenditures, regardless of the amounts. So, <clears throat> so, uh, in kind donations, mm -hmm. I don't know about that. I'll check that out for you. So I'll get that out to all of you. Just out of curiosity, uh, per the local charter, we had to pass a campaign finance and support ordinance, mm -hmm. which if I believe in the town attorney is our, is the town's campaign finance ordinance. And we are having to go to FCPA because of that. So we want to check with the town. I will attorney. double check that because I didn't, I don't remember the ordinance being passed, Words. but I will look because if it is, it's true. Three months. Okay, I will double check that because I don't remember that. Hmm. Okay, and then these are the reporting due dates if you have to turn them in. <laughs> so, and I will send out reminders for due dates if we have to do them. Um, prior to September 6th, October 4th, and October 21st, and December 5th. So the election's on the 5th. The, um, the canvassing should be done by the end of November. So we will be starting um, onboarding of council members in December. We know that's a really hard month for some people because of the holidays and all that, but we're gonna be doing some onboarding stuff. We're gonna try and get as much of it done as we can prior to the first meeting in January, which is when the old council leaves and the new council comes on board. So um, we're gonna try and get as much of it as we can. The only thing we cannot do for sure is anything that comes from our town attorney. So she will take care of that after the new candidates start. And then these are other important dates. So on September 3rd, that's the last day for a writing candidate candidate to file an affidavit of intent. So anybody who chooses to be a write-in. Um, on September 3rd, we're gonna do the drawing of the candidate order for the ballot here in council chambers at five. You're welcome to attend, or you can watch the recording later. We are recording these. And September 12th is the town hall 101, which is done by um, each department, usually the director or someone that he or she has designated if they're out of town. And I'll tell you what each of their departments do. And um, these are all things all of you can attend. Um, you don't have to um, you don't have to be elected to attend these things. You can come and attend them, and that will be down here in chambers from four to six. So, <clears throat> and that's all I have. So, um, if you guys have any other questions, I can answer those. I have a question as far as um, setting up bank accounts for the money to come and go. Do you have to have a federal tax ID for that, or is that? I not believe different? you do. I believe you do. Some of them have said that you can use your social because it is a local, well, it's easy to set up. Uh, yeah, et cetera. It takes like less than. Yeah, it's really yeah. simple. Okay. Okay. 
So if there's no other questions, um, I can hand out nomination petitions if you'd like. You can come by tomorrow and pick them up. We're not putting them online because we were never supposed to do that a few years ago. So <laughs> we now know what we're supposed to do. Um, I knew it then, but I wasn't the clerk. So, um, and I just would want to ask you to sign in. If you're going to take them, just be sure and sign in because I didn't get everyone's email address last time and it was hard to get in contact with everybody in order to send out the reminders about campaign finance and all of that. Come on in, Kelsey. <laughs> this is Kelsey. She's one of my deputy town clerks. Hello. So, so I think that's all, unless you have any other questions. No? You're welcome.